It's more than 90 years since we last played Tchaikovsky's Yolanta here in Stockholm at the Royal Swedish Opera. Now at last we have this production here again. And I'm so happy to have you here, the director of this production, uh, Sergei Novikov from Helicon Opera in Moscow, and the conductor, John Fiore. So nice welcome, to... welcome. So John Fiore, I, I start with you. Welcome okay. back because you've been here before. Yes. Twice actually. Yes. Uh, Eugene Anjegen and uh, Andrea Chenier. Right. Yes, and, and you are working all around the world. You could, we could say you are a guest conductor at uh, the foremost uh, opera houses in Europe and United States. Yeah. Also working with some symphonic repertory. So, uh, and you were in Nor Norway for, for a couple of years yes, also, I, yes. I was music director in, in Oslo for six years. Yes, so we have been speaking some Norwegian here. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if we compare Yolanta with the two other operas by Tchaikovsky that we know much better, uh, Eugene Anjegen and Dame of Spades, what can we say about the characteristics of Yolanta? Well, um, Yolanta is his last opera, actually it came right after Queen of Spades. And uh, to compare them to Anjegen and, and Queen of Spades, I'd say it's more on the lyrical side, a little more similar to Anjegen, I'd say, because Queen of Spades gets extremely dramatic and, and, and uh, has a much darker kind of quality to it. Um, for me, it's interesting because he wrote it pretty much the same time he was writing The Nutcracker, which is, of course, his most famous work. And I don't know if everybody knows that uh, Nutcracker was premiered on the same night as Iolanta. So they did Iolanta first, and then they did the Nutcracker. And for me, there's a lot of similarity in the music between the two pieces. I always get a little kick out of it, because every so often you'll hear a passage that sounds like something that would be in the Nutcracker. The big duet at the end has this big orchestral play out. It sounds like the pas de deux in the, in the ballet at the end. I'd ex expect the, for Iolanta to do some turns and, you know, with the with the prince and the brump at the end. And there's also when, the, when Vaudemont, the tenor, and uh, the baritone Robert come in, the music sounds very much like the Mouse King music in the first act of the Nutcracker. It's just I mean, the colors of it and the sound of it is very similar because he wrote it basically at the same time. Yeah, and, and it's, it's his la last opera yes. as well. Yes, yes. Can you sort of feel that in any way? Well, I mean, who knows if he knew at the time that he wouldn't be living very much longer because he was dead within a year after the premiere, no? Right. So, um, who knows? But he died due to the infection, so... Right, right. So, I mean, he didn't... I don't think he had a sense that he was, you know, that which you might sense from the Pathetic Symphony. You might sense that something's approaching, but yeah. not in this opera. This opera is actually very positive, and it's very full of light. That's the whole, of course, part of the story, which Sergei will explain. But the, actually, the sound of the orchestra, the, the feeling of, of the music is very much on the bright side and, and optimistic and hopeful. Yeah. You staged this production uh, in Moscow at Elecon Opera. It was two, three, three, years, three ago. years ago, yes. And we had it in our uh, plans for, you know, 2020, but then of course this pandemic came. Um, for us, Yolanta is quite, quite an unusual work in the repertoire. We, we did it here many, many years ago. Uh, Last time in 1929, first time in 1893. I didn't see that one, did you? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> me, me neither. <laughs> no. But uh, in Russia, it's not the case, of course. You, you, what place has Yolanta in the, in the repertoire of Russian opera houses? Well, I would say Yolanta is one, one of the schlagers among Tchaikovsky productions, among Tchaikovsky operas. Uh, because uh, here we uh, listen to his music where, when he's on the peak of his career as an opera composer. You know, he wasn't uh, always a successful opera composer. For example, his first operas such as um, uh, Voivoda and Undina, he even burnt them out. And uh, then uh, the third opera, Aprichnik, it is a strange Russian word. I would translate this in English like exceptionist. Uh, so it's about uh, the era of Ivan the Terrible. Uh, it was more or less successful, but uh, Tchaikovsky wasn't satisfied uh, with the music. And uh, uh, when uh, he created Iolanta already, he asked uh, the library of Mariinsky Theater to send him uh, his manuscript of this uh, musical score to renovate it uh, as far as he was 
already uh, uh, on the peak of his power as a musical composer. And uh, then Cherevichki again, he wasn't satisfied and he uh, rewrote it. And then, you know, some miracle happens because uh, he's creating uh, some musical scenes for his uh, uh, students uh, to pass uh, exam in uh, the conservatory. And uh, among this, uh, combining these musical scenes, we suddenly get one of his masterpieces, Eugene Onegin. And uh, fro starting from this period, he understands that he can uh, come out of the pressure of rules and canons and uh, musical traditions of uh, 18th century. And uh, he starts to create his opera uh, masterpiece, such as Mazepa, Queen of Spades, and Yolanta, of course. And uh, the, the subject of Yolanta, the story of Yolanta, for him is not uh, the new one as well, because uh, after Eugene Onegin, he creates a really a great opera of a big form, of big shape, opera made of Orlean. Mm -hmm. Wonderful too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, he is creating lyrics himself for this opera. So he's deeply inside of the characters, of the history, of all the uh, of all the matters and the consequences, so he understands the logic of uh, all this history. And Yolanta, by the way, is part of the story because uh, King René, her father, uh, he was uh, he got acquainted with uh, uh, Jean d'Arc uh, in the castle uh, of um, uh, Duke, uh, de uh, Duke de Lorraine. Uh, when uh, René was 18, uh, 19 years old. And uh, when Jean d'Arc says, uh, please give me your son, knights and horses, and uh, they will lead me, me to the court of the Dauphin of Shannon. Uh, son, it means King René, our King René from Yolanda. So it was uh, the part of the story, uh, he was already, uh, very well, uh, deeply in, inside of uh, the character. So he came again to this French history in Yolanta. Uh, but uh, th it was not maybe his main idea. Actually, uh, we see in um, uh, the documents that he writes in one of his letters to his um, brother uh, that uh, I would create such an opera, everybody will cry. And so we have it <laughs> have in you, the music. Have you ever done Maid of Orleans and Yolanta together? No, 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 I, I haven't. That would be rather interesting, don't you yeah, think? Yeah, uh, we, we may one day. Could be an idea for us. <laughs> someday, yeah. someday. Talking about the other Tchaikovsky operas, it reminds me that outside of certain countries like Russia or the Czech Republic, that people know maybe one or two operas. They know, and everyone knows Onegin. Mm -hmm. and. Some people know the Queen of Spades less, I think. Onegin's the one that's played the yeah, most. The, the most. Just like, like Dvorak, everybody knows Rusalka, but he, met, he wrote many no operas. Idea, right. Smetana too, The Bartered Bride gets played everywhere, but nobody knows about these other operas that are played all the time in Prague and yeah. places like that. We need uh, singers or directors yeah. or but conductors I mean, who sort of become ambassadors right, for the music. Right, but this yes. is why it's so wonderful to do a piece like this, which is definitely Tchaikovsky at the height of his powers, writing at an incredibly high level. Mm. And it's a very accessible piece, and it's a piece that one can really take in right away because the music is so overpoweringly beautiful. Yeah. But what can we say about the vocal writing? Because there are so many fantastic arias in this. They are, piece. yes. <laughs> well, I think that Tchaikovsky writes extremely well for the voice. I think that was clear even mm -hmm. in the in early operas. I mean, Onegin's very well written for singers, and I think singers like like to do it. There are some wonderful. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to, to interrupt you because Onegin, it was uh, his musical score composed for students. So right, he, but even there, he was in favor of uh, right. to help them to pass the right. vocal exams. Yeah, but on the other, you have to understand voices and singers right, to do that well. And not all composers, I mean, always understand the voice well. I mean, opera composers, of course, the famous ones who wrote all the great yeah. operas do. Yeah. And of course, all that tradition comes from Italian music from before, mm. when so many composers admire the bel canto period of you know, Bellini mm. and Donizetti and those people who wrote so beautifully for voice. But yes, and there are wonderful show pieces I, that you know, stand alone arias. The King's is the first one. I mean, Yolanta has a very short arioso at the beginning, which is very kind of an internal, personal kind of piece about how she feels about life and what she's missing in her life. And it, you feel this longing in the music. But a full developed aria, her father's aria, is the first big dramatic piece. 
which starts out with this incredible trumpet fanfare before it goes into the recitative and the very somber, self-searching aria. And then the contrast is the Robert aria, the baritone aria about Matilda, which is just amazing, full of energy and, and color and enthusiasm. And you think this Matilda must be some fantastic woman, no? Because it, uh, this aria is <laughs> She's not amazing. The, yeah. She's not in the, in the yeah. opera, but the, I mean, I'd love somebody to write a piece like that about me. Yeah. No, no? Right? Yeah. And then, of course, then we have the big duet, which is the centerpiece of the whole thing, mm -hmm. when, when Vaudemont and, and Yolanta get to know each other and discover things about each other. And it's like a big, it's almost like a th music drama, I'd say, that scene, because a lot of it's recitative, discovering each other. She discovers, of course, that she's lacking something, the thing that she was wondering about at the beginning, something's missing, and I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And finally, once we've gotten through all the recitative section, which is dramatic recitative, there's a nice G major duet, which is, you know, a nice clear form with a clear theme and the kind of development section and another clear theme and ending up together in this big wash of G major, which for me is, again, sounds a little like the pas de deux and the nutcracker. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, the, it happens near the end of the opera, yeah. too, like the pas de deux happens near the end of the Nutcracker Ballet. That, 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 that melody. Oh, yeah, I think of that more as a, yeah, there's, is there a mysterious aria with, with the, the Moorish doctor. And yes, I don't think of that, that's I think that's part of, like, the, the whole scene. But yes, it is a set piece, mm. which also has been done by itself. Yeah, they, they, they are like hits, you know, these melodies, yeah. because they stick in, in the head. You, you, you have them in the head. It's interesting that, that you mention that one, because the... The Ibn Hachi aria, the Moorish doctor who eventually cures her, mm. is extremely mysterious music. Yes, it really is. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's somewhat otherworldly. Like it, it doesn't sound like the rest of the piece, the way it's scored, the way it, you know, the effects in it. It's basically the same melodic line repeated over and over, but the orchestration changes, more and more colors come in, things happen, and it also it starts piano and it grows all the way to this huge fortissimo at the end, and then pulls back again. Yeah. The, the story, I mean, the story is, a, a, it's based on a Danish play by Henrik Hertz, and it's, it's uh, set in the Middle Ages with knights and castles. But you have done, you have, uh, you have done it more uh, uh, up to date. Uh, it's a story about our time also. It's, it's a bit classical, but also very uh, up to date. So, so uh, please tell us something about your interpretation. What, what can this story tell us today? It is a story uh, up to date or maybe about near future uh, because we see the closed castle where uh, some uh, girls and ladies uh, live uh, totally cut off other world, uh, staying just with their gadgets and devices. And uh, we understand that uh, their duty is to uh, to cure and take, take care of uh, some Yolanta, which is very well educated, very well brought up, and actually she is uh, self-sufficient, but uh, she understands uh, that she lacks uh, some some feeling, something. So she she ha she has uh, to know uh, something more about uh, her human being. Uh, actually, she is just uh, 17 years old, so uh, it is regular for every young uh, woman. So, uh, but we understand that uh, her blindness uh, is, uh, is not, is not uh, a disaster for her because she feels herself perfectly well and she understands what's uh, staying around and she goes freely uh, right and left, uh, forward and back because it is her her own world, and uh, she doesn't feel that uh, she can do something uh, material, but she, she understands the lack of some spiritual. Uh, and uh, what we see around here, we see uh, people who are uh, involved in their gadgets, do mm -hmm. not pay t uh, attention to, to Yolanta, uh, and uh, here appears the question, who is more blind? those people or Yolanta who perfectly see by her heart and uh, by her soul. And uh, regarding this famous duet of Yolanta and Vodemont, when Vodemont says, look, uh, you cannot see the sun and uh, the light, 
to uh, to sing glory to the God, and uh, she answers, uh, "No, you 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 have mistaken. I do not need uh, ni sun, no no light, to to sing the glory to the God. I do it by my soul." Uh, and uh, so, uh, when he tries to explain her what means red and uh, white, she doesn't understand. Uh, she even do not know these words. You know, during the rehearsal period, I rewrote lyrics of Vodemon and added some strange letters. So he pronounced some, uh, for example, not red, but grad. Mm -hmm. And uh, the singer of Yolanta, she said, ah, what, what's, what's he singing about? And it was exactly the reaction of real Yolanta because she has never heard these words, so she doesn't understand what the sense mm. is. Uh, so uh, for her, it, it doesn't mean uh, anything. She is self-sufficient. Yeah, it's a classical uh, way in, in all uh, drama history. I mean, that the blind person is actually the one who is, s s sees the re it's reality. Like, and like, the, in, and it's like in King Lear or something. Ex exactly. Right, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's very, very traditional. Yeah. Um, we, we play Yolanta uh, on its own, uh, on her own. I mean, usually it's paired with another piece. As you have already said, it was uh, from the beginning, uh, Nutcracker and Yolanta together. But uh, uh, what, what some people have asked me, why are you doing only Yolanta? Why are you not doing something else uh, with it? Uh, so what, what can you say, uh, pros and cons about playing it on, on, on its own and playing it together with another piece? Well, in Helicon we played it with uh, intermission. Yes. So it consists of two parts. Uh, first, uh, before arrival of Robert and Vodemon, and the second, uh, go until the end. And actually, it works um, pretty well. But uh, I think that uh, Yolanta is a masterpiece, which uh, uh, is uh, which is enough impressive for one evening. And when you compare it to some other operas, uh, you might lose because uh, the impression of uh, this uh, shadow of Tchaikovsky uh, is 100% uh, uh, self-sufficient. And uh, you may spoil <laughs> it a little <laughs> bit with the second part. Uh, I did not uh, talk about Nutcracker because it is completely different. Well, the audiences are different these yes. days. I mean, it would be very interesting to do them together these days, but I think the audiences have become a bit separated. There's an opera audience and there's a ballet audience, but to actually put it together would be, I'd love to do that someday, yeah. that would be fun. Yeah. But I think actually, especially considering we're just coming back from the pandemic, having an hour and a half opera is actually perfect because at this point we didn't know, you know, what the rules would be when we open. And actually, some theaters like to do shorter performances just to be on the safe side, and this is a perfect thing to do. Also, we have to make some adjustments because we weren't sure how big the orchestra could be. So we had a very clever guy make a reorchestration, which means that some of the instruments were taken out and it were rewritten for other instruments in the wind section mostly. The strings are a little smaller than they would be usually, but it's a very good arrangement and it covers all the notes, everything is played. It's just that sometimes you know, bassoons will be playing horn parts or, or you know, the an oboe note will be played by a trumpet or something, just because it, at that point they weren't sure how many people could actually be in the orchestra pit, what was allowed. So I think it's, it's a very clever thing they did and I think it's a perfect length coming right back from the pandemic. I think it worked out very well and certainly the piece stands on its own, I think. Definitely, whether you do it with an intermission or don't do it with an intermission. It's, it's a very satisfying piece of work. I have one last question. I mean, this opera is about senses, and Yolanta, she has lost one of her senses, the eyes. So it, what, what sense? I mean, there are hearing, seeing, feeling, tasting, uh, smelling. smelling. Yeah, th those are the five. So, so uh, which one would you think would be the hardest to lose? Well, for a musician, it's obvious. Yeah. <laughs> Hearing, of <Yeah>. course. <laughs> but 
Yeah, but but. Yeah. But Beethoven was okay. <laughs> well, yeah, but you have to. But see he heard it. He was composing, and he heard it in his head. That's. Yeah, but you have to see the singers and see the the musicians when you. Well, I mean, act. there have been conductors who've gotten very old who don't see very well anymore. Like Toscanini could barely see anything at the end. Okay. But he had everything in his head. It was all memory, yeah. and he would you know rehearse by memory and. You know, I could conduct a lot of things without, you know, seeing. I could point and okay, tell good. people. Okay, <laughs> good. But um, hopefully not for a long time. Uh, what about you, Sergey? Well, uh, I, I would just cite the quotation of Saint Exupéry uh, in his Little Prince. He says that uh, the most able to see is the heart. Mm. You you will not be able to see the main thing by your eyes. So, the feeling of heart seeing is essential. <laughs> Thank you so much, and we are so much looking forward to the performances. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we wait everybody for our performances here in Royal Opera House. Thanks a lot for inviting us. Tschüss und Tag. Tag so Tag.